Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian, and we're continuing our coverage of the presidential transition with the election of Donald Trump as the 45th Chief Executive of the United States. And we are here with Tom Davis, uh, West Point grad, uh, served in the United States Army, uh, then uh, served a distinguished career in industry at Northrop, and then Chief Strategist at General Dynamics. And now you're with the National Defense Industrial uh, Association, where you're a fellow, and you're also uh, the, the chairman uh, at... Uh, uh, DAU, you're the, the the Defense Industrial Chair at the Defense Acquisition University. Tom, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Bob. Good to see you again. Um, so, from your standpoint, as somebody who's been watching, uh, you know, both the political scene, the strategic scene, the budget scene, the industry scene, the military scenes. Um, from your standpoint, what are some of the significant changes that you're expecting the Trump administration to make when it comes to defense acquisition, budget strategy, et cetera? Well, I'm thinking that uh, based upon what uh, Mr. Trump has said during the campaign, he's going to put a greater emphasis on defense. There's going to be some more spending. He's talked about an increase in force structure, and he's talked about an increase in uh, some very fundamental building units out there in the forces. So I think uh, there's going to be more emphasis on defense, and I think that that will translate down to a, a greater emphasis on what we're buying and how we're buying it within the defense industry. Do you have any sense on how the buying is going to change? I mean, obviously, when the Obama administration came in, uh, defense acquisition reform was a big deal, the better buying power initiatives. Uh, Frank Kendall, the undersecretary for acquisition, a uh, fellow West Point grad, uh, was – has made the case that it's working. We are controlling costs because of some of the basic blocking and tackling we're doing, trying to control requirements better, use cost metrics and incentive tools. Um, what's your verdict on those, uh, on how successful Better Buying Power has been, and what do you expect is to come? I think that uh, Frank Kendall's done a fa fabulous job. I mean, just staying on the job for seven years has been really something unusual for somebody in that particular uh, discipline that he's been in. Um, I think the industry has uh, benefited from that. I think they've got the message that they need to do some things, which will enhance better buying power, give the government more bang per buck, to use that old phrase. But I think going forward, one of the things that we're going to have to take a look at is the actual structure of the defense industry itself. The thing we're basically working on at uh, NDIA, and I'm trying to emphasize to students at DAU, is that over the course of years, we've had an accumulation of things, all the way from budget levels uh, down to requirements for regulation, meeting certain standards. Uh, there's even been a standard the government has put out that the RFPs have to go in on a particular type of paper, which uh, has an additional cost dimension to it. I think the government's got to come to the realization that a lot of things that have been done over the last several years have themselves discouraged people from entering the defense market and encouraged some of those in it to leave, like UTC did with his divestor Sikorsky. So we need a healthy defense industry. We've got to have a healthy defense marketplace. And I think there are a lot of steps that need to be made to make sure that happens. When you look at some of the proposals, obviously Senator John McCain has won a very, very close re-election race. It's going to be an all-Republican Congress. Uh, obviously, acquisition reform, especially in the context of Goldwater Nichols reforms, has been important to, to Senator uh, McCain, but also Jack Reed, and also on the House side for Mac Thornberry and for, for Adam Smith. And those players will still be remaining on the scene. As you look at the acquisition reforms that the Congress is looking at, folks will say that they're well-intentioned but may also have some negative implications for the industrial base but also for the Pentagon. What are the concerns that you think, what, what, are, what are the reforms that you think are on track and what are the reforms that you think might be a little bit off the mark? Well, let me just uh, actually be a little more global in that answer. I think a lot of things that pass for defense reform, defense acquisition reform, are actually items that are too small. Uh, I went to a conference not too long ago and a senior defense acquisition individual made the comment that one of the major things we're looking for is to try to redefine and redetermine who actually should have milestone declaration authority. I think of the things that go into defense acquisition reform, who has milestone declaration authority is very, very low on the food chain. Some of the major things that need to be done are things that are going to actually shape the defense industrial base itself, which has shifted from a large number of providers to a small number of providers and a large number of subcontractors. I find it very interesting that at this point in time, we just actually have five major defense providers. But at NDIA, we have 1,659 corporate members, uh, which basically tells you that most of the defense industrial base at this point, as I think you well known, is actually in the provider and the sub-provider small company side. And things that are going to be done and need to be done to make sure that that particular 
part of the industrial base stays involved, stays engaged, and stays uh, committed to providing the services and the products that are needed are things that really need to be looked at. And I don't know the government has a real, a real handle on that yet. Do you think, um, obviously, um, the defense industry has been using, um, working to get the share prices up? Um, obviously, they've been shedding a lot of bodies in order to do that, shedding a lot of facilities to do that, do a lot of consolidation, um, curtailing a little bit on the benefits that are going to the rank and file in particular, uh, while at the same time using their cash flow and as much of it as possible to bear buyback shares and then also to throw throw out as, as dividends as large as possible. So we've had really you know tremendous stock price growth uh, over, over the last couple of years. And there's a concern, and I think you have this concern, and I want you to express it, about whether or not that's a good model for the industry and whether or not, as some suggest, with a top line that's going to go up is merely going to reinforce what could potentially be a strategic bad behavior on the part of the industry, for example, not wanting to invest as much as it should to prepare for a next generation of systems. I think what you've been seeing in the industry is exactly what you described, a lot of st- Steps that have been taken to try to keep earnings per share up, both on the numerator and the denominator. On the numerator, by reducing a lot of costs so that the dropping the average total cost curve, to use a phrase I used to throw out from my microeconomics uh, professor degree at West Point, uh, taking uh, earnings per share, earnings and making that big, taking the denominator, making it small by buying back stock. That's just not a sustainable long-term model. At some point in time, that's going to have to change, and revenues are going to have to grow, and we're going to have to attract more people uh, into the business. So as revenue goes up, I'm hopeful that you're going to see less emphasis on uh, doing things, and I'm reluctant to use this phrase, but I'll use it anyway, manipulating earnings per share uh, in a way that's not helpful for doing the things that needs to be done, such as investing in capital expenditures, uh, independent research and development, and other things that the industry will have to do as a provider so that it can meet the expectation of its customer, which is to provide additional technological capability. That's the foundation of this quest for the third offset strategy. You have to have additional innovation and additional things that are stepping in, to um, which are more risky which are more risky. The industry and the customer have both become rather risk averse over time. And I think uh, as a group, they have to, they have to get over that and recognize that risks have to be taken and risks have to be absorbed. How do you do that though? Because the concern is, right, the innovation initiative, DIUX, all of these are ways for the department to try to ingest more commercial technology at a time when, you know, we, we were just discussing a chart that you'd put together about where the industry was in 1961 in terms of the, the Fortune 100, much less where the industry is now, where you could put the top five companies, for example, into Walmart or Apple's capitalization uh, market cap. Um, how do you as somebody who's been observing and living in this ecosystem for decades, what, in your estimation, are the things that have to happen to take everybody where they want to go? Because some people, for example, will criticize Senator McCain and say, look, you have all the best intentions, but everybody is positively terrified about showing up in front of your committee because somebody took a risk or something ended up becoming expensive because they took a risk. One of the things you see in the commercial sector is there is an acceptance, particularly out in Silicon Valley, where Secretary Carter went out and gave a speech at Stanford back in April 2015. There is a wide understanding that we are a risk-taking operation and organization. We're going to take risk. You know, we're going to put money out there, and if things don't work out, we're going to absorb some losses, and we understand that. We'll move on and put it into something else. Our process in the Pentagon has evolved, and in the defense industry, uh, has evolved over the years into a very risk-averse structure. If something doesn't go well, it eventually winds up as a congressional hearing, and there are accusations thrown back and forth because something that was a risky venture to begin with didn't pan out. We just have to learn if we want to have innovation, if we want to take real risks, if we want to move in directions that are not conventional, that are not known, if we really want to do that, we have to accept the idea that the commercial sector accepts, that Silicon Valley accepts. There will be failures. Things will not work out. When I was a young uh, Army officer, we got handed this, this truck, uh, just to use something pretty simple, called the Gamma Goat. 
Uh, it, you, uh, hey, when I woke up this morning, the gamma goat was not something that I thought I was going to be discussing today. <laughs> well, but go ahead. You're on a roll. Well, it was an innovative truck. You know, it was basically, it had a two-cycle diesel engine that was behind the cab. It was a box in front connected to a box in back. It had six wheels. The idea was it didn't have a spare tire because you had a strut. If you had a flat, that you could move tires around and... Uh, it had innovation written all over it, but the bottom line was it was an awful truck. Uh, you couldn't really put stuff in it. Uh, you couldn't sit in the cab and talk to your driver because that engine behind you was too loud. But it was, it was innovative, and the Army tried it. They put it out there. They kept it there for several years and uh, finally reached the conclusion that this just isn't what we need. And away it went, and it was replaced by other vehicles. Uh, did that generate some bad feelings uh, in the Army and between the Army and the, cust and the provider? Well, certainly it did. Uh, but did anybody really have a major congressional hearing or were there enduring uh, acrimony over that particular vehicle? No, we moved on to something else. We tried that. It seemed good at the time. It just didn't work out. We've got to kind of accept that going forward, that if you really want innovation, if you want new thoughts, if you want new approaches, you're going to have to accept the risk that goes along with that. And at the extreme end, the risk, of course, is failure. I always uh, tell people that Thomas Edison interviewed, I think, in about 100 years ago and asked how the light bulb was coming. And he says, well, I've tried 1,200 things for the filament and none of them have worked. And the reporter interviewing him said, well, so you haven't made any progress. He says, well, I've made a lot of progress. I've found 1,200 things that don't work. So we, we've got to get somewhere near that mentality and that, uh, and that feeling. The industry itself, in my estimation, has become incredibly risk-averse over the last several years, and it's reflecting the personality of its, uh, of its customer when it does that. So the two of them together have got to reach a conclusion that if we want innovation, we have to accept risk, and part of risk is failure. But one of the inherent problems appears to me to be that the contractors themselves are more litigious. So they're looking for every opportunity, for example, if they lost the contract, to try to find some way, even if it's completely spurious, to try to extend it. And, and some companies have been rewarded for multiple protests and, and then, you know, circumstance changes or whatever, and, and then they end up retaining the contract that they had lost in competition. All of our rules are designed to encourage and maintain competition. If you're Apple and, and Davis Industries comes up with a great idea, you can buy it on the spot. You don't have to compete it. Whereas the government goes, hey, that is a brilliant idea. Now I'm going to compete it. And all of a sudden, you lost your first mover advantage, which is mm -hmm. one of the disincentives, for example, from a Silicon Valley standpoint to try to get into this. What are some of the changes that have to happen to incentivize the first mover so that the guy who makes the investment can actually be rewarded? And then what are some other changes that have to happen on the legislative front to allow that to happen so that you can get that good idea out there without necessarily going into an incredibly long, protracted uh, competition cycle and then the bid protests and everything else, you know, and, and, and the, the slowness, the oversight requirements that tend to go, that, that also burden the system? Yeah, I have a view on that which may very well be uh, overly optimistic from your view but uh, when you talk to the major uh, uh, providers these days the major companies almost all of them will tell you that there are so few programs out there right now that we can bid on that each individual one has a disproportionate important to us that you would not be seeing if there were a lot of programs or if there was an expectation of a lot of programs uh, they'll almost all tell you that when we put our rfp together when we get that team that's, we pull together to respond to the RFP that's come out. Part of that process is actually coming up with what's going to be our protest strategy if we don't win. Now, building the protest strategy itself, of course, is a cost that they have to endure. But I think a lot of that will go away uh, once you have more programs to bid on, if you do. And once each program in and of itself is less singularly important to the health and continuation of a company. Now, on the legislative side, I, I presume when you said that, you're talking about Congress and congressional behavior. Uh, this gets back to more or less what I, what I said before. You know, Congress just has to understand that this is going to be company behavior in an environment where you've got a handful of companies and a handful of major, of major programs. Uh, it used to be that there just weren't that many protests. You put in a bid, you either won or you lost, you moved on. 
Uh, nowadays, uh, it's almost expected that there's going to be a protest. I don't know if the GAO has expanded its staff or not, but I'm sure they probably have given it some serious thought because pretty much all of them wind up being protested in some form or another. More programs, and I think combined with a greater understanding that we have to accept risk and people have to accept losses and so forth, will probably naturally solve uh, that particular thing. Commercial industry, obviously, um, that's been a very, very high priority, the Defense Innovation Initiative, the DIUX, the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, to try to attract Silicon Valley and commercial technologies to the department. If you talk to some of the guys from these highly uh, innovative firms, they're very nice, they want to keep talking to the department, but fundamentally, they will observe, you know, the government will take five years to get something rolling and five months is the eternity of my lifespan as, as a company before right. the investors come down and, and, and basically either shoot me yeah. or give me some more money. How do you align these interests? What are the ways to align those interests to get that innovation into the department that the department so craves? And frankly, some of these companies would like to help on a national security basis. But for example, they find the auditing requirements mm -hmm. too intrusive. I mean, there are a whole bunch of reasons that just these companies find totally alarming, and even perhaps UTC finds alarming enough to want to sell Sikorsky to Lockheed. What's the way to look at this to bring some of that great thinking quickly into the department in a way that's a win-win for both sides? You know, if I had the answer to that, Vago, I think that I would probably be being interviewed by somebody else. But uh, uh, I, I will tell you, it's an optimist, in my view, it's an optimistic move by the department to try to attract people from Silicon Valley and that particular community into the defense marketplace. Uh, at NDIA, when uh, Secretary Carter went out there and gave his speech, uh, set up DIUX and so forth, uh, a woman who owns a company out in Silicon Valley, which is, uh, and who is an NDIA member, sent an email back to uh, Craig McKinley, the president and CEO of NDIA, and her comment I thought was really quite clever. She said, using to use a female metaphor, uh, it was an interesting proposal, but he doesn't have a rock big enough that anybody will put it on their finger. Uh, I think in a nutshell, that kind of encapsulates what the challenge is uh, out there. The department uh, you know, has a process that takes a long period of time. It's well outside the planning horizon. It's well outside the product horizon of these companies that exist out in Silicon Valley. They're not going to adjust to the DOD process. They're just not going to do it. So if there's going to be a move of more companies like this at Silicon Valley getting into the defense marketplace, which would be a fabulous thing, as you well know, I've been arguing for some amount of time that the defense marketplace uh, has too few inhabitants at the moment, and they seem to be shrinking. So getting more into it is a great objective. But in order to do that, there's going to have to be more change on the DOD side than there is likely to be on the Silicon side, Silicon Valley side and the commercial side, no matter what um, uh, the patriotism level of these people happens to be. A guy who'd, uh, I respected very much from days gone by who'd been in the industry and he'd been in government several times, you know, once told me that the major challenge of trying to get commercial enterprises in the defense marketplace is that things are just so different. And he had a great phrase one time. You know, He told me once that a commercial firm hopes to sell a million things with 100 parts. A defense firm hopes to sell 100 things with a million parts. And he says the, the engineering, the marketing, all that is completely different as a result of that. I don't know that the department grasps that to the extent that this woman, for instance, who sent the note in uh, uh, that I just described, uh, they grasp it. I'm not sure the department does. So the process that really has to change is the department process because I don't believe it's a re reasonable expectation to expect that the commercial process as well. Uh, two final questions. Question number one. Um, right now, and obviously uh, the Trump administration is going to fill out its plans um, over you know what, the, what its program plans are going to be, its budget plans are going to be, all of that. Do you and there is some question that it will be more systems and more things, and that, for example, initiatives like the Innovation Initiative, mm -hmm. um, Third Offset, uh, w which some view as strategically core to the future, whereas others regard it as just sort of mumbo-jumbo, you know, just get more soldiers, more planes mm -hmm. and ships, and you'll be fine. From your standpoint, should these, should these initiatives survive into the next administration? 
Well, I hope they will survive in the next administration because the initiatives themselves have great merit. I mean, something has to be done to try to create a, gre- uh, a greater communications network, a greater communications line, and a, a greater sense of commonality and community between the defense marketplace, those who are on the, uh, the customer side and those who are on the provider side. So I hope that will happen. I hope what will also happen is going to be uh, a more in-depth review of what has to be done to actually expand the players in the defense market. Uh, I don't know that the, uh, the DOD and the people in the acquisition community and so forth fully grasp uh, the, the inhibitions that exist out there, the barriers to entry, the reluctance to take on the additional overhead that one has to have to comply with the auditing and with the, uh, with the contract uh, oversight and so forth. I don't think they fully grasp the uh, the burden that a company would have to take on in order to do that. So I would hope that there's a dialogue that goes forward, that there's a better understanding of what some of these barriers to entry, uh, overhead requirements, and other requirements are that inhibit people from getting into that. Jack Gansler has a great chart he likes to show. He used to be the undersecretary, as you well know, that uh, you know over the last 20 years the number of pages of regulations in the federal acquisition regulations have gone from 100,000 to 180,000 so we keep piling on additional requirements and regulations and that's all happened at a time when the defense marketplace itself has compacted has contracted has gotten much smaller now, these trends are moving in the opposite direction so we're going to have to turn one of them around and from an NDIA perspective what's the message that you guys are delivering to the Trump team as they formulate their ideas about the defense industry and the defense enterprise as they're going to be managing it? Well, I don't know we've delivered any message to them yet. I, you know, He's only uh, been the president-elect since last Tuesday, and I think there's still a lot of uncertainty as to you know, who's going to wind up where. Uh, my last understanding when I had a discussion about it is there was still some discussion as to who was going to be the, uh, the person from the Trump transition team who was actually going to go in and talk to Secretary Carter. So I, I don't know where they really are yet. I think the message that we will wind up telling them is that uh, if you want to run uh, the enterprise here you know, more as a business, then we have to take some steps that are going to capture some business principles. And among those is we're going to have to do things that are going to lower the need for overhead. We're going to have to do things that are going to try to get more of the defense dollar into the fighting force and away from the support force. We're going to have to take a hard look at the defense agencies, the number of them, and what they require. Uh, several people point out to you that you know two thirds, and think that includes Secretary Carter. You know, two thirds of the dollars over there go to pay somebody uh, from the defense budget. Go to pay somebody to do something. Uh, a lot of that is just overhead in various places. So we have to have a serious discussion on how much overhead do we actually need, and where do we need it. Do you think, and is there a danger, that in a populist administration, obviously the president-elect was swept into uh, office on a, on a wave of populism for a variety of different drivers, and with that sometimes comes a sense that you know there should be greater pressure on contractors, particularly those who do business with the federal government. Is there a potential or a danger or a concern that there could be even more profit pressure on the companies ultimately than what they may have faced over the past few years? Um, it's an interesting question, and it's very uh, interesting just because of the world in which we live right now. I mean, these companies are managed by different people than uh, they were historically. They have uh, financial objectives that they put out, which are very similar to the financial objectives of just more classic uh, countries and uh, companies, rather, in the commercial marketplace. So uh, I think there, there will definitely be some pressures that continue to exist in the companies to have financial performance. Uh, We live, whether we like it or not, in an era of shareholder activism. Shareholders have demands. They have things that they want. Of course, a lot of these shareholders in the major companies are institutional holders, uh, which are retirement plans and 401ks and all that. But uh, over the course of time, particularly when I was in industry, I noticed more and more people coming to meetings and asking pointed questions and you know, there are even people out there who run companies uh, that will tell people who are shareholders and representing institutions, we'll go to the, the meeting and ask the hard question for you, and here's what we think they ought to be. So we're in that environment right now. The, the companies will find it very difficult to get into an environment where they're 
margins that they've managed to earn are going to get out. The hard part is they're they're doing better with margins. Most of them are into low double digits now, but they've gotten there because they've been, as I often say, dropping the average total cost curve, and they've been dropping that by doing some things involving benefits and personnel that uh, in the long run just are not sustainable. So there's going to have to be a change there too. Do you think... You know, you mentioned the R&D point and how important it is to spend and to invest. What will it take to get the industry to actually invest? I think there really has to be a recognition that uh, you know, taking risk and uh, not having risk be completely uh, disastrous to a particular company uh, is going to have to be understood as more acceptable. Over the course of time, you know, when I started out, I was with Northrop Grumman, and the culture back then with Northrop Grumman, uh, even then, was very much that this is a company that was interested in being on the cutting edge of the next great thing. And of course, in modern times, you've seen that, uh, you know, stealth, uh, unmanned vehicles. Uh, you know, Northrop Grumman got into unmanned aircraft at a point in time when we couldn't even find anybody in the U.S. Air Force who wanted to have any of them. Uh, but over time, all the companies have become more and more risk averse. And the customer uh, has got to understand that that's where they're going because that's where the customer has been going. You know, if the customer is really serious about third offset, looking at new ideas, looking at things that are innovative, looking at things that no one has thought about before, uh, they're going to have to understand that you know, that goes hand in hand with things that are going to work out and things that are not going to work out. So the companies are going to have to, at some point in time, in some way, uh, be comfortable that if I do something or bid on something or get a contract or pursue a technology that absolutely doesn't work out, that that's not going to result in a poisonous relationship with the customer. It's not going to result in a poisonous relationship with the Congress. It's going to result in, well, we tried that. It didn't work. Let's move on and try something else. And also working on the street part so that investors have a higher comfort level that everybody is going to have to take risks and you're going to win some and you're going to lose some because that's one thing that they're all terrified of is going in front of their investors in an activist arena where people are used to getting a lot of money and saying, hey, I missed my EPS target by by a couple of, you know, a couple of cents is terrible. A couple of dollars is catastrophic. The management of the companies has got to be able to go before the shareholders and say, you know, we we took this risk on this particular program. We thought it was a reasonable risk to take, and we uh, were very much of the view that had it worked out, uh, you would have benefited very nicely for this. It didn't work out, but here's what we're going to pursue next. You know, this is our next thing that we're going to do that we, we think has a good possibility of success. You know, you can do that once or twice. I think about the third time you're going to find out that the shareholders are going to get rather impatient with that because at that point they're going to request, they're going to start suspecting the judgment about what it is you're pursuing. Do you think that, that uh, to sort of use that example, right, uh, Raytheon has had a series of big wins, uh, advanced missile defense radar, electronic warfare, uh, battlefield radar. Uh, they were rewarded, but the stock price took a little bit of a hit every time they were investing in some of these things. Uh, eventually, I think, the, the market corrected for mm-hmm. it. And then there are folks who look at, for example, what Textron did on the Scorpion airplane, mm-hmm. spending a lot of its own money to develop a light attack aircraft. On, on, on that, does the government at some point have an obligation to actually buy these products that industry comes up with, if for no other reason than to encourage people to continue investing? Otherwise, isn't its message, I want you to invest, completely hollow? I I think the government probably, it'd be, I I believe, unrealistic to expect that the government ever reaches the point where it feels it has an obligation to do that. Uh, But realistically, I think the government probably ought to, uh, taking the bigger picture into account, uh, reach the conclusion that there probably are going to be times when I'm going to, for practical purposes, for strategic pur- purposes, for longer range purposes, buy something that I probably would have been disinclined to buy before and use that until the better thing comes along. I've seen this over and over. In, uh, the system that we had in the artillery most of the time that I was on active duty, Harry Truman would have been very comfortable stepping into it because we used the same procedures he did in World War One.
Uh, nowadays, when I am talking to young artillery officers and they describe what they do, I mean, I wouldn't recognize what they do because so much of it is automated in a way that we, we just simply never had before. But why would that happen? Well, that happened because we actually went ahead and bought a system that we knew was not going to be optimized. It was not going to do a lot of things that we thought, at least graciously. But it, we bought it anyway. And there were two reasons. One, we kind of had a great confidence that the soldiers would figure out a way to make it work, which they tend to do. And secondly, we knew that it, at some point we're going to get another piece that's going to come in that's going to either supplement or replace that in a way that's really going to be um, a step function up from what we had before. You have to do that from time to time. And what that means in the industry is, you know, the industry has to be confident that uh, the government will actually incorporate this into its thinking and into its operations, and when it goes in there, we won't wind up with something that people are accusing each other of poor behavior or bad behavior. Uh, I had an old boss in the Army that I always loved, General Max Thurman, uh, who used to always say, look, I didn't lie to you, the truth changed. Well, the truth changes a lot when it comes to technology, and sometimes they'll change rapidly. Uh, but we have to understand that that's what happens, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there was uh, a failure of forward thought or a failure of management of something else. And, of course, now the most important question. At the end of the year, there will be a football game. It will involve West Point and the United States Naval Academy. How do you think it's going to go this year? Well, let's see. I've been optimistic on that game for the last 13 years, and I've been disappointed for the last 13 years. Um, um, so I, I have gone to the point where I always make the, make the case that uh, when it comes to the Army-Navy game, there are two that are important. There are the one that happens when you're a, a freshman, and there's the one that happens when you're a senior. And in my particular personal case, I'm 2-0 and o in that one, so I'm going to cling to that particular number. Sir, thanks very much for inviting us into, into your home and for spending so much time with us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Vago, and appreciate all you try to do for us. Thank you.